So we now turn to the question of um, where exactly the Indo-European, Proto-Indo-European homeland was. Um, as I said, there's two main theories. Um, and we'll look at these, not in too much detail, uh, because people have, have their whole careers around this question. Um, first off, the, we know the rough area, as I said earlier, that we've got, we have some idea um, using the words which are found in the Proto-Indo-European lexicon. It enables us to say that, you know, it was, um, it wasn't a coastal civilization, um, that it, there was certain flora and fauna in the locality. So we can narrow it down. There's also the fact that um, we have loan words from the Indo-European tongue in neighbouring languages. So we can know roughly where the zone it was in because it's influencing languages next door, like the, um, the, the Finnish language has certain loan words from Proto-Indo-European. Um, so uh, more than any other language, you know. So we know that it was probably neighbouring um, that kind of northern Scandinavia um, up into up into the sort of Urals. Um, and so that gives us a question. Um, it gives us an idea roughly that it, it possibly was the Russian steppes, as has been suggested. It's not the Mediterranean. It's not east of the Urals because they haven't got bees. And it turns out that the Pontic Caspian um, steppes are the most likely, is the most likely sort of place for it to have um, started in most scholars' views. And this is seconded by the fact that there are genetic studies showing um, a, a diaspora of genetic material throughout Europe and into Asia from the Russian steppes from about 3500 BC. So there was a movement of people carrying culture. So the question then is, did they carry language as well? That is a possibility, but it doesn't preclude the language having spread earlier um, during the Neolithic, which is what Colin Renfrew says. So this is the the, the steps here, the Russian steps. Um, it's obviously sort of flat prairie. It's where the, the horse was um, domesticated. Um, and genetic studies have shown that, as I've said, there was a spreading of at least genetic material um, from this region from about three and a half thousand BC, um, spreading all the way across to sort of northern India and to Western Europe. Um, the culture that is associated with the Russian steppes at this time is, is normally called the Kurgan culture. Um, this is a, a name that became popular in the 60s when Maria Gimbutas um, described the Indo-European um, diaspora as heralded by the Kurgan culture um, and the name is sort of stuck. A Kurgan is a burial mound. So we're looking at people, uh, individual male warriors, mainly um, buried under single mounds with a, with a single uh, inhumation burial. And um, we find this springs up in the Russian steppes and then spreads throughout Europe. So it, it spreads with the Bronze Age. By, so when you look at Britain, for instance, the, the Bronze Age round barrows that we, that we associate with that time period, containing mostly single inhumations, are part of this same culture. And they, they take over from an earlier culture where you had um, barrows with, um, numerous burials um, within them. Now this is going to be a bit text heavy. I've lifted this from my thesis. Um, but what, what I'll go on to show in this talk is that the uh, although the genetic studies show that the, there was a spread of culture from about 3,500 BC in the Bronze Age bringing 
a new um, wave of technology and genes um, possibly bringing the Indo-European languages. When you look at the mythology, and this is something that I did for my PhD, you find that the, the mythology, although it has got a, a sort of warrior base to it, and it is very sort of Bronze Age in its um, on the surface, underneath you can tell, and this is what I've done, um, and I'll, I will show this in a later part, I've reconstructed it to show that it actually has a Neolithic and possibly Near Eastern core. This is the mythology. So why would you have a Neolithic mythology and yet a Bronze Age culture? So um, the myths are, are, are suggesting possibly that the Indo-European traditions are older. doesn't necessarily mean the languages. Um, this is a question that was, that was quite difficult to try and solve. Why would they have an older mythology if the language wasn't older? Um, so this is, yeah, bear with me while I read this out. Analysis of Indo-European myths shows that far from differing from the myths of the Near East, the earliest Indo-European myths show the presence of a cosmogony, that's a creation myth, on a Near Eastern pattern. So that's something that we would suspect was um, linked to the Neolithic, to farming myths, um, um, coming from the Fertile Crescent with the, the advent of farming. So you can explain this in two ways. Um, firstly, that the, these, that the mainly cattle-based as well, the cattle-based myths were present in the mythology because the Proto-Indo-European culture was Neolithic, as Renfrew says, and possibly came from the Near East, not the Russian steppes. Or is it that the Proto-Indo-European culture was originally pastoral and androcentric, um, of which now no original myth can be reconstructed. And it did come from the Russian steppes, but it very quickly took on farming, mainly cattle symbolism, um, that paralleled Near Eastern forms. Um, so, in other words, did it adopt this Neolithic tradition and Neolithic mythology through borrowing from a neighbouring culture? So that's the question. Is the Indo-European um, tradition originally um, uh, Neolithic and Near Eastern, or is it from the Russian steppes and borrowed the mythology? So that was a question that I started to look at in the PhD. So this idea that it might be Neolithic is, is Colin Renfrew's idea. Um, such an idea necessitating a reappraisal of the dating of the origin of the Indo-European language dispersal was suggested by Colin Renfrew, whose Archaeology and Language, 1987, hypothesized that the Indo-European languages dispersed from a common Proto-Indo-European ancestor not in the 4th millennium BC from the Russian steppes, the so-called Kurgan hypothesis, but from Anatolia sometime around 7000 BC, and that the language that had accompanied the spread of farming, and that was the language that accompanied the spread of farming. Some archaeologists, including Barry Cunliffe, have been supportive of the idea, while others, included, including David Anthony, argue that the language shows obvious signs of, of having been formulated during the secondary Neolithic, accompanying the domestication of the horse. So he's saying it's a lot later. It can't be um, at the start of the Neolithic. Now, criticisms of the dating have led Renfrew to actually suggest a, a slightly tweaked Chronology, so he now believes that it spread from the Balkans, um, originally from Anatolia, then spread from the Balkans in about 5000 BC. Um, yet, despite the unpopularity of his position, Renfrew's work has been supported by academics outside archaeology, by paleolinguists such as Gray and Atkinson and Ryder, and by studies of the development of other world language groups that argue the diversity and distribution of the Indo European languages suggest a longer period of development than the current Indo-European dispersal model provides. And it's also suggested by certain work on genetic mapping, which um, uh, people like Barb in 2005 say um, his genetic reconstruction seem to reflect um, a, a Neolithic expansion of the language. 
but again this is slightly different from other studies which uh, have been going on over the last five years or so. If Renfrew's hypothesis is correct, the proposition that Near Eastern derived myths could have spread with farming via the Balkans to Britain still holds. What must be explained is how and when such Neolithic imagery came to appear in the myths of the Indo-European speakers in the Bronze Age. If the Pontic Caspian steppe theory of Indo-European origins supported by Antony, Mallory and Gimbertus is correct, then the presence of Near Eastern motif, motifs so early on suggests cultural interchange occurred between Indo-European speakers and farming-based societies at a very early date, before the main spread of the languages. So this goes back to the, to the question of if there is Neolithic material in the mythology, then could it be because the Indo-European peoples from the, from the steppes had borrowed that mythological material from a neighbouring culture? And if so, what would that culture be? One possibility is that there was close contact between the Proto-Indo-European speakers and the neighbouring farming population. The most widely accepted theory concerning the origin of Proto-Indo-European Proto culture is that followed by Mallory and that it originated somewhere on the Pontic Caspian steppes. Antony has proposed that Proto-Indo-European diaspora coincides with the domestication of the horse and that the culture's homeland can be placed archaeologically in the region of the Yamnaya culture. A genetic studies show a genetic spread from this area throughout Europe and beyond in the Bronze Age. Though a more recent genetic study suggests that this picture is rather too simplistic. I'll leave that for people to, to pause and read if they want to go into the details of this. But the, the suggestions are that, that there was a group, uh, there was a spread of um, genetic and cultural material from the Russian steppes through the Yamnaya culture. Um, at the start of the Bronze Age. So then the question is how the Yamnaya, who were a, um, a horse riding steppe population, how they got hold of a Neolithic cattle based farming mythology. Um, it's unlikely to have been indigenous. The Yamnaya were derived partly from steppe Mesolithic hunter gatherers and partly from other population of hunter-gatherers from the Caucasus. However, they did not develop in isolation, but were influenced by people to their south and east, the Mycop culture and the Kukuteni Tripilia culture, which is genetically linked with Neolithic Anatolian farmers. Although Gimbertas theorised the latter culture was one of the first to be destroyed during the Indo-European expansion, this has not been supported archaeologically, and it may have been that some form of integration occurred between these neighbouring cultures. This might have seen cultural sharing whereby a Yamnaya language, Proto-Indo-European, and mobility was integrated with knowledge of the old European farming cults. Such integration between the Yamnaya and Kukutani Tripilia cultures has been suggested by Mallory. He says, ethnographic evidence suggests a very fluid boundary between mobile and settled communities, and it's entirely probable that some pastoralists May have settled permanently, while Tripolians may have been integrated into the more mobile steppe communities. The resultant archaeological evidence certainly suggests the creation of hybrid communities. And so this is important because the um, the Kukutani Tripilia culture has all the hallmarks of a Near Eastern derived farming goddess based culture that we see um, inherent in in the Indo-European myths that I've reconstructed. So we can see here that the Kukutani Tripolia culture um, is located um, sort of to the northwest of the Black Sea, and that's neighbouring the Yamnaya culture. The Yam, sorry, the Yamnaya culture um, is just to their east. Now this is a sort of um, sort of material culture that the Kukutani um, culture shows. It, it's um, a Neolithic, very pottery strong, pottery rich tradition um, showing um, 
a number of sort of symbolic features, circles, zigzags um, that we find um, spreading through the rest of the Neolithic um, all the way through to Britain. There's also a large number, and we will talk about this in the next lecture, of figurines, especially female figurines, um, which may be associated with perhaps a, a goddess or priestess figures. And this culture was unlike the um, unlike the Yamnaya culture. This was a, a settled farming culture that um, inhabited large, you could almost call them proto-towns, cities. Cities is probably the wrong word, but um, you have these amazing structures um, that, that have been discovered. These date to sort of I'm getting off sort of four and a half thousand years Here's a rather um, artistic uh, interpretation, um, loose interpretation, but it shows, um, gives you an idea of the sort of um, settled nature of these uh, of these communities and also their textile artwork. Um, it's reconstructions of the um, of the clothes and textiles that this culture possessed um, based on some of the evidence from the um, clay figurines. And this is showing the, um, the spread of the, the so-called Kurgan culture um, sort of from the Russian steppes across the top of the Black Sea, integrating the uh, Kukuteni Trapilia culture and then spreading through Europe. And this is a slide I should have showed earlier. This is the, the Yamnaya um, uh, cultural zone. And um, this is yeah, a summary of the, um, uh, the different hypotheses of the spread of. Um, the Indo-European languages. So you, at the bottom you've got the Anatolian hypothesis which is arguing that it's spread with farming and at the top you've got the steppe hypothesis with the Yamnaya spreading um, with um, wagons and horse riding and the Bronze Age. Um, the question, it, it's really still up in the air, did the language spread before the Bronze Age? Did it spread with farming? The mythology certainly seems to be a farming mythology, but it could just have been picked up by the Yamnaya culture when they integrated the neighbouring Kukutani culture. So there, there is a mechanism whereby that mythological material, earlier mythological material, can be present within the language group and within the speakers, and it's still to have been a Bronze Age spread. But equally, you could say that it supports Renfrew's hypothesis that the, that the language did spread in the Neolithic and that the, it had a Neolithic mythology spread with it. Both seem to make sense. Or, or both, um, uh, both can, can be explained. Um, which one I think, I, I don't know. I really don't know. I, but I am adamant in suggesting that there is a Neolithic base to the mythology, if not the language. Definitely the mythology. And here again is a spread, showing the spread of the genetic spread of the um, Yamnaya um, culture through Europe, bringing with it um, this sort of step DNA um, that spreads with the Bronze Age, uh, eventually reaching Britain um, sort of with uh, 2500 BC um, with, with Bronze Age technology. So, it's very warm.